So here we go. So so let, let's let's pick it up again. So we just discussed the um, sort of conceptual stuff about diversity. Let's finish up that conceptual conversation by talking about our intellectual thinking about how we got here about diversity. So in other words, what, where does this idea of diversity come from? So uh, our, our Western ideas start with Plato, the guy on the left, and Aristotle, a student on the right. And Plato had this idea of idealized forms that you know, he thought there's this ideal version of a chair, this ideal version of a, of a bluebird. And then, and then things are copies of that, right? So that, that, that's, that strongly influences Aristotle. He's the one that first um, uses this idea of a genus as sort of a generic or more general category of, of life, and then a more specific term for that particular type of life. Um, and that, that will go, that will be perfected later on by Carl Linnaeus, but, but um, uh, he gives us that. And, and he also, along with Plato, he thinks that, that stuff is non-changing. So when we have a snake, a snake is a snake is a snake is a snake, and it's always been a snake, and it always will be a snake. Um, and that pretty much in the Western world, that, that we're, we're, we're stuck with that for a long time, right? Amazingly creative thinkers, the Greeks and, and the Romans and that sort of, that era, and then we enter this period of not a whole lot of uh, really intellectual innovation for a long period of time. Okay, we're going to jump forward to uh, Carl Linnaeus, a guy that so liked his system, he changed his name to Carlius Linnaeus, right, from Carl Linnaeus. Um, so amongst other things, he gives us this idea of by nomial nomenclature, the genus and species. So every, every um, unique species, we have this uh, genus, capitalized, genus, capitalized, species, lowercase, uh, name. And so he created this idea of placing species with similar characteristics into nested hierarchies. So this is his famous uh, system nature that, that does this, right? And so, He's like, oh, these, these grasses kind of look like they're all the same, and these trees kind of look like they're all the same, and, and starts, starts putting things together in these, these groups of, of various hierarchies. Another key thought here in terms of thinking about diversity comes from um, this paleontologist, Cuvier, and he is, um, uh, makes two key observations. This is in the, the late 1700s. Um, so he says that uh, younger fossils are much more similar to things that, uh, younger fossils we don't seem to have around anymore are much closer related to the things that we do have around that you and I can walk around and see as compared to the much older versions of them, the, the older fossils, the ones deeper down in the ground. That's one observation. The other key observation was he said between, in, in looking at, um, uh, uh, stratigraphy, stratigraphy and things of that nature, when we look at the different layers of rock, sometimes we see, you know, uh, uh, you know, organism A, a lot of organism A, and all of a sudden it stops. And we don't see it anymore. And then we see something, something different show up. So these are key observations that really start to fuel um, a lot of this thought. So paleontology is a super important a driver in our, in our initial conceptualization of diversity. And so, so from those, those, those observations, he starts to come up with these ideas of what we would now call speciation, or the, the emergence of new things, and the extinction, or the going away and disappearing of some things. Right. So what do we do? How do we explain this? So he... Um, uh, came up with this idea of um, that there were these big giant catastrophes that rolled out. And so something happened and all of the, the individuals that were there for a while get taken out somehow, right? And so an example that all of the folks in his Christian world would, would know is the Great Flood, Noah's Great Flood, right? So the, the world was sort of normal and all of a sudden a bunch of water came over, drowned a bunch of stuff, and then the water went down. Um, so super... Uh, uh, and so that seemed, that seemed to jive with the stuff that he was reading the Bible, and it also seemed to jive with the stuff that he was seeing. Um, next is Lamarck, and you guys have probably heard of him because this is 
This is in all your intro textbooks when they have a chapter on intro evolution or whatever. And they're normal, it's normally proposed as this guy was so wrong, right? Um, amazing innovation, right? So, so it's easy to look back now when someone isn't, isn't perfectly correct and we're like, oh, that guy messed up. But this was a, a huge innovation. So Lamarck um, publishes this um, book um, and in the early 1800s, and he basically argues that organisms can pass on traits to their babies. Um, now, turns out the typical explanation that is given is not how we think it usually works, although we have found very rarely some examples of this actually can happen, but, but mostly um, this, is, this is not how we think it happens. But the idea here is the giraffe is sitting here and he's like, oh my gosh, that, that leaf is really far away. I'm going like, to stretch my neck to, you know, to, to eat, eat that leaf. And then after many weeks, many months, many years, whatever of doing that, it, my neck gets a little longer because I stretch it. And then it gets a little longer still. And then it gets a little longer still. And then pretty soon, I have a long giraffe neck. And then when I have a baby, I have, my babies have long giraffe necks, right? That's obviously not right because Arnold Schwarzenegger kids aren't big, muscle-bound, you know, crazy folks. Um, oh, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know his kids. Maybe they are crazy. But, but, but the point is that they're not muscle-bound, right? Um, Okay, well, there you go. See, you guys know more about <laughs> I should be careful with my cultural references here. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so Lamarck, we call this Lamarckian evolution. Um, that's wrong, but this idea is really powerful, that somehow the, 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 some essence of, of what makes us ourselves is passed on from, from mom to, to baby and so on and so forth. Okay, next important person, Charles Lyell, another one of these uh, uh, sort of paleontology-type folks. And uh, he writes a textbook called The Principles of Geology in 1830. And um, he tries to figure, and, and so the, the subtitle of his book is An Attempt to Explain the Former Changes of the Earth's Surface by Reference to Causes Now in Operation. So um, he says, you know, maybe it wasn't this great flood that happens every so often or the giant volcano that happens. Maybe the processes that are influencing life are going on every single day of, of the year, nonstop. So rather than like these big giant jumps, and he doesn't say those jumps didn't happen, but he said maybe at least as important, if not maybe more important, is this continual ongoing thing. And so he called that uniformitarianism. uniformitarianism. We now call that gradualism. But it's just these processes always operating. And so he took that to ultimately um, uh, mean that uh, the Earth's surface, the, or, or, or what looks like our surface to us, is the result from continuous things going on all the time. So one example are, so here we have these, so this is, in, this is from his book, and there's an illustration right here, and you see this old, I think it was Greek temple, um, if you guys can see this, so these, these are some, you know, marble columns, and so here's, you know, it's by, by the water's edge here. Um, there's actually barnacles and things growing on those columns, right? Right now, there ain't, ain't no waves up there, right? But this suggests that, you know, at some point over the last several thousand years, the sea level was different, at least in this particular area. And the sea was higher there, so that these critters that are normally in their inner tidal started colonizing these, these columns. And, that, and so that's pretty, that's pretty good evidence that, that stuff is sort of always changing, always going on, always dynamic. So maybe we're in this constant sort of state of flux, and things are constantly changing a little bit, a little bit every day. Maybe it's a sea level rise going up, maybe it's erosion, but, but these processes are all going on. Um, and, uh, the, and then one last one uh, before we get to the big daddy is uh, Thomas Malthus, right? So this is, this is uh, so-called the, the Malthusian thinkers. That, the, the current wave that we're in, our people would be referred to as Neo-Malthusians. But um, Malthus wrote this essay um, in 1798, which was highly influential, highly influential. Um, it's called An Essay on the Principles of Population. And he basically said humans grow uh, exponentially in terms of uh, our ability to make, make offspring. Uh, food, our ability to make more food, does increase over time, but doesn't grow quite as fast. 
that we grow, historically, we seem to grow linearly. So when those two things combine, that's going to lead to a problem. And so the number of mouths to feed is going to outstrip the amount of food for them. And, that, and, then, and then the population, in this case of humans, will be controlled by bad things, things we don't like. Uh, disease, starvation, conflict, and war. And so his argument was, hey, we should take an active role in this and that it's a moral life to, to choose to limit the number of folks rather than have it done through disease and starvation and everything. Now, this is, this is taken by some of the eugenics people eventually to say a justification why we should you know, kill people that we don't like for whatever reason. Um, but fundamentally, fundamentally, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to mean that, right? This is, this is just simply looking at the the potential growth of a population and the potential resources that that, po that population would need to be thriving. So all these things, all these books I just showed you and all these thinkers I just told you were on the bookshelf of this dude, Chuck D. What? Yeah, you guys aren't public enemy fans, clearly. So, um, so Chuck D, this is Charles Darwin. This is how he's always portrayed to you all. Right? This is not how he was. This is what he looked like when he was old and famous and everybody in the world thought he was such a brilliant dude. He does look sad. Yeah, he does look sad. So this is what he looked like when he did the important stuff. He was your age. He was your age. He wasn't some ancient old dude that was super famous and whatever. He was just like you. What? And a big four. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. See, respect for the baldy kind of guys. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Uh, I'll title on you. No, just kidding. Okay, so, 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 okay, so Charles Darwin, young kid, and tell me if this sounds familiar. His dad is like, yo, dude, this is what you're going to do. He's like, what? Uh, his dad was a preacher. He's like, you're going to be a religious man. He's like, God, really? He's like, yep. He's like, God. And then he doesn't really like that. So his dad's like, all right, okay, I'm going to send you the way to school, and you'll be a doctor. He's like, God, I don't want to be a doctor. And so um, he goes to school, and basically he's a dork, right? He's a weirdo. He's a freak. Um, uh, I don't know why this thing doesn't show up for you guys. Uh, when I my advance it. Um, so anyway, so, so this is a cartoon from when he was in, in essentially college. And his friends uh, made this caricature of him. And what do you see? You see a guy walk around on a giant back of a beetle with a big giant bug net. Because that's all he liked to do. He liked to walk out in the fields with a, with a bug net, grab some bugs, check out some butterflies, look at these ants, look at all this. Didn't like to go down to the pub and drink and, and you know, and do shots and stuff, right? Didn't smoke out with all the cool kids. Was on the sports team. He was just, he loved walking around in nature and just looking at all this cool stuff. And so, so uh, go it, Charlie! Apparently that's a real burn, right, back, back in the day. Um, so so this, was, this was this guy, right? Not a popular guy, not this or that. Going to school, didn't want to be a doctor, right? And so when his, the, the thing that first brings him to fame is this voyage of the HMS Beagle with, with this captain named Fitzroy. Uh, and that was 1831 to 1836. Let me be clear. He left the UK in 1831 and basically didn't come back for five years. So uh, it takes a certain person that really isn't wanting to be dad's priest or dad's doctor or whatever the heck it is to just disappear for five years, right? That sounds good to me. Um, so when you go, so what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is the, the British Navy at the time is highly structured, right? And it's highly classist. And so the officers, they're important people. The sailors, they're lame. They're grunts. They do all the horrible work. They're uneducated, all this kind of stuff. So when you're when you're a, a captain and you're going to go around the world for years, you want a companion, right? You want somebody that you can talk about art with or politics or whatever, right? 
So one of the things that the cabs would do would, was take a so-called naturalist. Hey, you come with me, and then we can have dinner together, and I, somebody I can talk to, right, that's of my quote-unquote class, right? So Darwin's like, okay, I'll go. Um, and, and he sails around the world, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, he, he, he spends, after he gets back, he spends a lot of time writing up his, his, his travels, and he becomes super famous for going around and giving, essentially, lectures about stuff. He then does a study of coral reef, the formation of coral islands, coral atolls, which was awesome. Super, it's, still the, it's still the foundational text in that, that island evolution. Um, and talked about, talked about um, volcanoes. He would go on to do study of barnacle sex, all kinds of stuff. Any one of these things would have made him famous. But he did all these things, which is pretty crazy. Um, so the deal, so here's his voyage. So basically they went out on the Beagle and they went around the world. And this was in the age of empire, right? So this is in the age of, hey, let's go see what's out there so we can basically conquer and steal and all that kind of horrible crap, right? But at this stage, this was not a voyage of conquering. This is a voyage of figuring out what's the what. Mapping some coastlines. Let's figure out where safe harbors are, that kind of stuff, right? Now, Darwin, also maybe like many of you, desperately, desperately seasick. And he's on a boat for five years. Like, like violently seasick, like cannot work kind of seasick, like almost going to die kind of seasick. So as a consequence, any time they kind of, sort of, maybe a little bit, kind of got close to land, he'd be like, I'm out. I gotta go collect some bugs and go measure the coast. I gotta go. And boom, he'd leave, right? So he'd spend as much time as he could off the ship. So sometimes that would be a couple hours. Sometimes that'd be like a couple days or weeks. And they're like, hey, you guys drop me off here with a couple dudes and, and you know, I'll meet you back here in two weeks or something of that nature. Or you drop me on this side of the island, I'll hike across and I'll meet you on the other side of the island. That kind of thing, right? So when he's on, when he's on those uh, making his journeys on, on terrestrial spaces, he is taking notes, he's drawing pictures, he's making samples, he's collecting you know, pressings of plants and, 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 and sketches of the critters that he's seeing and all that kind of cool stuff. So he goes all around the world. They go into Antarctica, right, or, or, or the area we now consider Antarctica. Um, he collects all these birds, that, some of which are still in museums that people are actively using for research now. Um, all kinds of samples. These are all some of his co collections on the right. So fantastic stuff. Fantastic stuff. He comes back, and there's no YouTube back then. So, and, and people didn't travel. So this dude just spent five years going to the pole and going to the jungles of, of India and all, all these crazy places, right? He didn't go to India, actually. He went to South America, so. But um, so he, would, he became a hit. People go, hey, yes, please come to my dinner party and regale us with your stories, right? And he would tell stories, oh, I saw this crazy animal. And people thought it was, it was awesome. It was exotic. It was, like, it was like the TikTok of the day, right? And people were like, what? Can't get enough of them. So then those little going to dinner parties turned into, you didn't have a job. Well, let me like write this up. So then he wrote his, essentially his travel, a travel book. And it was super popular. And that made it people, more people wanted to come give seminars and all that kind of stuff. So, so we did all this great stuff. So when we think of Darwin, his most, the, the writings that, that were going to influence us here today in terms of talking about biodiversity, that all came later, right? That, the first stuff was just describing, you know, initially what he saw. He would spend several years, decades, processing all that stuff, right? And adding to it and thinking of it and doing kind of, all that kind of stuff. So here's a quote from him. So he says, during the voyage of the Beagle, I had been deeply impressed by discovering in the Pampian, and this is in South America, in the Pampian Formation, great fossil animals covered with armor like that of existing armadillos. That's one, number one. Number two, by the manner in which closely allied animals replace one another as we go southward over a continent. So we're seeing sort of turnover of, of the fauna. And thirdly, by the South American character of most of the productions of the Galapagos Archipelago. So the Galapagos Islands were really, really uh, fascinating to him. And then fourthly, and more especially by the manner in which they differed slightly 
on each island of the group, I'm talking about the Galapagos here, none of these islands appearing to be ancient in the geological sense. So all these things are kind of bumbling around in his brain. He's trying to make sense of these, these patterns and these observations. The first step always to good science is observation. Observation, observation, observation. And he was a fantastic observer. So he's doing all this kind of stuff. And, um, and these are some of, from his notes. And he says, it was ev at one point he says, it was evident that such facts as these, as well as many others, could be explained on the supposition that species gradually became modified and that subject has haunted me. So he sat on this for a long time. This seemed to be in contradiction to his Christian upbringing. This seemed to be in contradiction to what was being preached as as an immutable earth and a, and a, and a created and locked in place earth um, that was uh, supposedly being preached by um, these religious experts. Um, and he'd do all kinds of stuff. And so this is, from, this is from one of his notebooks where he's sketching out what we now think of as one of the very first, if not the first, evolutionary tree that he puts in there. And importantly, Darwin makes a note to himself and says, there's no higher and lower. There's just differences. There's just branches. But it's not that the branch tips are better than the, the main stem. It's just they're, they're different. Okay, so um, here's Darwin's key observations. Life exhibits variation. So some of us are a little bit taller than our sisters or, or, or shorter than our brothers or whatever the heck. So there's, ex there's variation in life. Two, species are mutable. Species can change. Species are not locked in. And again, Darwin is synthesizing all those things I just talked about, those, those previous those books on geology and all, the, all these, these, these thinkers. Species are changeable. They're not locked in stone. And species may be related to each other in space, in a geographic context. And when you pull all that together, you get what he would term eventually evolution. So evolution is the process of adapt, and so Darwin described it as the process of adaptation to the environment and eventual phyletic differentiation. Today, we most popularly describe, like in your, in your textbooks, your intro bio textbooks, they'll say evolution is a change in gene frequency between generations. But that's because we knew about genes. He didn't really know about genes back then. So evolution, adaptation, and eventual differentiation. And the classic example is Darwin's finches here, where we, we start with one, one uh, bird or a couple birds that blow over from the mainland that, that are wherever they are, I have this traditional bird beak. But then when they're there, there's, there's some selection pressure to change that beak, to feed on, to specialize on different seeds or different insects or whatever. So we eventually see the radi adaptive radiation of uh, Darwin's finches on the Galapagos. Okay, so how do we get evolution? How do we get this biodiversity with the, the, the core, core processes to get that? We have four different parts. The first is natural selection which is what you're most familiar with, right? And you guys, this list should all be reviewed. You guys should have all had this, so go through this fast. But natural selection, right, which is adaptation to the current environment and then passing on that, that, that ability to have that um, phenotypic expression uh, to your, to your um, offspring. So natural selection, response to selection pressure. Two, genetic drift, which is um, a random walk. So that's where we, um, there's, there's no selective pressure, and, but just by happenstance, um, the frequency of a gene changes in the population. Uh, three gene flow, and that's when typically we think about this when we have another population, come, we, we suddenly have contact with a, a group that we haven't had contact with, and we get some of that new genetic diversity flooding into our local community. Can lead to evolution. And then uh, we, can, we do see sexual selection as well, um, where we see, um, in, especially in um, uh, uh, sexually dimorphic species, 
that um, certain individuals might prefer to mate with a certain individual that, that has a specific <coughs> series of attributes. Um, okay, so, so all this stuff is gonna, ha and, and then speciate, and we'll event, this stuff can lay, lay the groundwork, we'll eventually get speciation different groups when we have some amount of being reproductively isolated. And we can be reproductively isolated through any of these four potential mechanisms. Okay, so uh, species concepts. So this is, this is our last sort of big thing here in terms of the, the, the intellectual uh, groundwork. So how do we get these things? Actually, I'm gonna talk about the processes. I'm gonna talk about the processes in a second, but, but, but um, again, evolution going on. It's going on right now, always happening. We're getting new species all the time, even though the, the challenge that we're mostly talking about in our class is that the rate of extinction is greatly exceeding the rate of speciation, but, but don't be fooled. We are still having speciation happening right now, right today, all over the planet. When it comes to defining species, this is one of the things that, that Professor Klein talked about in his TED talk that you guys watched. Um, it, it's, it's actually non-trivial to figure out what is a species or not. And I would argue that our amazingly powerful and ubiquitous molecular techniques have caused a crap load of problems for conservation, which we'll talk about. Um, but but um, the basically there's, 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 there's no one definition, there's no perfect definition for what is a species. Um, and so we have, I'd say, three most popular ways of defining a species here. We have the morphological or the morphospecies concept, the biological species concept, and an evolutionarily uh, defined concept of species. I'll go through all three of those in a sec. So morpho, bio, and, and evolution. Okay, morpho species is the one that we, we most frequently can access, the easiest one to look. So this is, hey, this butterfly is pink, this butterfly is blue. Or, or, or this uh, mouse is really, really big, this mouse is really, really small, right? So we're, we're putting it into a category, a species category, based on what it looks like, how it visually appears to us. So this is for macroscopic critters, right? This is for stuff we can see with our eyeballs. And so you can either call it morphological species concept or you can call it morpho species concept. And most people I'd say would probably use the term morpho more so than morphological species. Morpho species. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll just say that um, this is by far the most common in the field. This is what we use when we walk around. Hey, that leaf looks like this, that's that species. This stem looks like that, it's that species. This, this critter has this kind of fur, it's that species, right? This is what we rely on on like a day-to-day -day basis. So morpho species concepts, particularly for practitioners in the field doing conservation, is fundamentally important and useful. In fact, when we do our lab on Wednesday, we're just going to use some, some visually, you know, some, some, some broad categories of grouping of critters. So we'll use a, a, a morphological grouping of critters. Okay. Then we have the one that's in your textbook that everybody teaches that, that, that's fundamentally uh, you know, that most people think of as the definition of a species. And this came from this guy, Ernst Meyer, uh, and he defines, and so this is a guy that studied birds and, 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 and bones and, you know, paleontology, that kind of stuff. And so it totally makes sense for, for him, for, for his interest. And so he said, Ernst Meyer said, species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other groups. So that's the classic biological species concept definition. You guys should definitely know that. That's, that's the famous one. This works really well for birds, for mammals, for you know, the kind of things that we, we think of as quote unquote wildlife, right? The warm fuzzies, the big eyes, the fur, the feathers. This works well for those guys. Um, I actually met Ernst Meyer before he passed away. Uh, he was a cranky old dude. <laughs> he wasn't particularly warm, I'll just say. Uh, and I think he was somebody that, that took pride in, in um, defending his ideas. Uh, and I'd say he, uh, that's not only old, old folks, but um, 
But that was much more common back in the day, was to be confrontational and everything. And I think some of that confrontation maybe um, got in the way of some more collaborative thinking about some of these ideas and, and how we could go forward together as opposed to my idea is better than your ideas. But that's, that's, uh, that's my opinion. Okay, then we have uh, the evolutionary, evolutionary, evolutionary species concept. And this is the one that's mostly pushed by our, our molecular uh, bio friends, right? So they want to tell you this is it. And they won't tell you this is, this is the only it, right? And because they often don't know a natural history and they also often don't do conservation, they, they argue very vociferously this is the only way we should think about species. So and the evolutionary concept is using um, DNA. And so we, we group individuals based on their DNA similarity as, as a, uh, a way to look at uh, evolutionary relationships, et cetera. This is really powerful for things that don't have clear, conspicuous morpho, morphological differences, right? So archaea, bacteria, that kind of stuff. That's really where this, this approach is, is most useful. It's really fundamental to DNA barcoding, genetic barcoding which is a way of us trying to figure out how many species are in this area, right? So it's fundamentally important. All three of these definitions are useful and important. Biological, morpho, evolutionary. Different groups will have you believe that all, the one of them is better than the other. They're all, they all have their place and they all are useful. Um, the challenge we have, that's barcoding. So the problem we have with this one in a conservation context is um, the species, one of the species uh, that I worked on for my PhD had a name. Before I worked on it, it I'm talking about Latin name now, right? G genus and species. The common name, ironically, hasn't changed. But the Latin name, which is supposed to be the solid one we all go to, right? Our go-to um, one. The Latin name hadn't changed in a long time. Then I, then I did my PhD, which is in the 90s. And then as I was given a talk one day, um, a, a colleague said, hey, dude, you know the species name changed. I'm like, what? I'm like, oh, shoot, i got to go fix all my stuff. And so, so the name changed. Since then, it's changed six more times. And that, that six more times is because of different sequencing and, and different, uh, uh, you know, looking at the, the genetic makeup of this critter and thinking, oh, it actually belongs in this genus or that genus and da-da-da-da-da, right? Totally cool with that in the abstract. But what's happened now is one of the ways that people want to get into biotech is they want to get a master's degree, right? And because then they can, then they can jam through and they can go work for Amgen or whoever, which is totally cool, right? It's all good. But they have to do something for their master's work. So a lot of times what some of these mills, some of these graduate, mill, gra gra graduate degree mills do is like, hey, come on in. And it's not like you come up with a concept. It's like, dude, you're not going to be a researcher. You just want to get this degree so you can go make some money. So plop on in. And what are you going to do? I'm going to grab these five grasses and, and sequence their DNA and then put them in a tree. And then, oh, and then I'll throw it in some program that's going to make the, the most parsimonious match. And then, oh, actually, these things that we thought were the same species, these are different. And they publish it and they go on. They leave. And so. While that process is science and it's cool and it's not wrong, I'm not implying these people are wrong, but that's gotten completely out of control. Completely, completely, completely out of control. Because when we do conservation, as you guys all saw, when we were using the BIOS viewer, for example, um, you know, we're, we're like, hey, are there more, uh, I don't know, bald eagles this year or last year or 15 years ago? We have to be able to track stuff through time to look at these trends, right? And as the names constantly change, it becomes harder to go through the literature. So now, instead of just searching for a species name, let's say, or a genus, I have to search for three or four or five or six different you know, genera. And then, and, you know, maybe I can remember to do that, but maybe the next person that's going to do it isn't going to have as much time, and she's going to forget one of those things. And so it's, just, it's, just, it's, it's become a nightmare to keep track of things, right? And so again, that's not to say that we shouldn't be doing genetic um, uh, characterization of critters and stuff, 
but it's gotten completely out of control. And it's, and it's tangibly harming conservation efforts because it's harder for people to, under, to, to make sure we're talking about the same critter, the same organism. So a lot of us will default to using the old names just because, uh, not the old Latin names, but the common names, the old common names, which is ironic, because common names are normally the things we think of that change more, right? Like this community calls it that name, and that community calls it that name. And the idea with Latin names is, hey, these are stable. These are, we can all be consistent, we can all agree on them. The Latin names in some cases have gotten, gotten crazy. So, so, yes, there you go, there's my, there's my speech for the day. Okay. For all these types of speciation, however we measure it, evolutionarily, morphologically, whatever, differentiation is key to get us to this diversity level. And so we're going to go through these because some of our conservation challenges are going to impact these, these things. So how can we get groups of organisms to be isolated from other groups of organisms? Well, the first, the most obvious one, the easiest one to conceptualize is just physically apart, right? So physically separated. We could also have something that is environmental, so some, some gradient or something of that nature that makes, it, makes us essentially different. Either of those we would call allopatric speciation, meaning changing in, in, different, in, a, in a different place. So, you know, maybe we had these squirrels and they once were running around all this plain, and then we had the Grand Canyon, and then some of them were on this side, and some of them were on this side of the canyon, and they could no longer get to mix, and so they differentiated. That's a classic example of, of allopatric speciation. We can also have other types of isolation, though, to generate diversity. One could be behavioral isolation. So maybe one critter starts, or a group of critters start to develop a a uh, special sm ability to smell something, and they, I don't like individuals that eat those berries or something of that nature, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna be less likely to come into contact with those individuals I think smell funny or, or whatever. Uh, we can also have uh, mechanical isolation, um, which you can get from like reproductive structures and things just physically not being able to, um, to interact. And we can also have physiological isolation when, um, uh, our hybrids are produced. So we did produce offspring, but those offspring aren't as fit as the parents. That can lead to um, uh, speciation. And those last three examples will be examples of, of speciation in the same place. That same place is sim, sympatric, and so we call it sympatric speciation. So we have broad strokes allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. So here's how that allopatric works. So Let's say we have a bunch of a beetles here in this valley, and then we have some big giant torrential downpour or something, or an earthquake or whatever, and it changes the river, and now the river is gonna go through our field. And so now I have some beetles on the upper part of the field and some beetles on the bottom part of the field, and they, they, they can't swim, they can't cross the water. So effectively, we've, we've been split, and effectively we're in different physical places. And the river is doing what it's doing, and over time, something happens. Let's say the, the dudes up north get a little bit of, have, start to get a little greenish on their shells and they get greener and greener and greener and that green spreads across through the population, etc. Uh, and then at some point in the future, something happens to the river. Maybe there's another earthquake that a landslide, you know, uh, uh, fills in the river, blocks the river, it flows a different direction and now we come back into contact with one another. The test of that is once we come back into contact with another, if we maintain our genetic uniqueness, if we re maintain those, those, gen those unique traits. And so that would be, um, so, so now we've come back together and we theoretically could be interbreeding, but we in fact do not. And so those are what we would call quote unquote good species, meaning true, true species, two, two species now instead of one. Okay, and here's an example of that in nature. And so this is a, a, an insect that, that feeds on apples. And so we've seen this happen in, real, in the last couple decades on apple farms. So um, we've seen um, uh, uh, these critters. Um, so this is not allopatric. This is in the same place. And so these, these flies are all theoretically in the same area. Um, but uh, they... 
uh, land on different f fruit, and different fruit has different attributes, and so we're, we've seen the, the speciation of this particular critter even in the same orchard. Um, and so before 1800, it only fed on hawthorn fruits. In 1864, we first found it on apples inside the Hudson Valley, and then in the 1960s, we started seeing them on other fruits. So these guys have speciated and they no longer breed. The ones that are on the hawthorns are no longer, or the apples are no longer on the cherries. So that's an example of sympatric speciation. Okay, we could also talk about things like African lake cichlids. Cichlids is this very diverse group of uh, freshwater fish. And so on the right is, is an example of all these uh, representatives of these different uh, fish species. These are all in the same uh, area. In this cake, in the cake, in this cake, I can't talk. In this case, in this big African lake, and we've seen the same pattern in these smaller African lakes around here. Um, but basically, uh, uh, they, you know, on the big picture, they kind of look similar. Some look different, but, but some of them kind of look similar, but they have different, oftentimes, feeding apparatus. And so in this case, these are the, the structures of their teeth, which implies or, or, or has to do with the food they're ingesting. And so um, some of them you know, crush snails, uh, some of them bite other fish, um, some of them uh, uh, dig into the mud to get uh, in fauna. Um, some of them feed on the scales of other fish. They don't, they don't eat the whole fish, but they bite the scales off of the fish, um, so on and so forth. And so, for example, this guy up here on the left eats the eyes of some other fish. Nice. Nice, you're welcome. Uh, the guy on the right is a cleaner fish, so he, he feeds on the parasites, ectoparasites, on other uh, fish. The one on the bottom is eating uh, invertebrates. Um, the one in the middle is going <laughs> to scrape algae off of rocks and vegetation and things of that nature with sort of a rough sandpapery type of uh, teeth. Uh, so on and so forth. So that would be sympatric. So they're, they're, it's happening in the same place. So we can, it can happen different places, allopatric, same place, um, sympatric. All these things are going on, right? So, so we have multiple levels of diversity, and um, we can see all kinds of processes going on. And so we can, all this together is going to come to comprise our uh, diverse ecosystems, our diverse communities, and all the wonderful things that, that are at the heart of our biodiverse planet. Okay, let's talk about questions. Does that make sense? Sounds cool. Anybody questions about any of that stuff? Okay, let's talk about how much diversity exists. You've already had some readings on this, so this should be pretty familiar. But let's talk about how much stuff is out there right now. So first, let's talk about how we estimate the number of species on Earth. Um, and so this is a number uh, of just averaging a bunch of different studies. Typically, the ranges sometimes are as low as 5 million, but more typically in the last couple, last decade or so, people talk about probably on the order of 10-ish million species, 10 to 30 million, something like that, but, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll call it like 10 million-ish is probably a good just sort of starter to have a number. Uh, I guarantee 13,620,000 is not correct, right? That's just an average, that, that's a guesstimate. So that's not a real, uh, don't be fooled by the appearance of precision. How do we get to that number? Well, well you guys tell me, tell me, how, how can we get to, um, how can we get to uh, an estimate like that? What are some thoughts? Great, we can just go say, oh, hey, like Darwin, just go out and start counting every single thing we see. Okay, good. And where would you count? Uh, global databases. Uh, okay, so peop things that peop uh, information sources that people have already tallied, we can sort of pull all those together. That's a good idea. What else? Um, I was thinking like trends that count that you actually are unfair. Okay. Great. So we go out. We go out ourselves, and maybe not in a database. We could create our own database, and just start looking at the grass and count all the count all the butterflies and, and ants and stuff. Okay, cool. What else? What are some other ways we could estimate how many critters are on the earth? How many species are on the earth? Uh, 
John, Jonathan, give, give me another, give me a guesstimate. Well, I mean, like, can you tell, like, how many, like, species are being, like, developed and how many species are being extinct? Oh, okay, good. So maybe we can, we can estimate what we think the speciation rate is and the extinction rate is and sort of, you know, subtract one from the other. Okay, cool, cool. Any other, any other thoughts, any other guesses or ideas? William, anything? Those sound good, she says. She liked those. Okay. All right. So, uh, first thing we do is just like what you guys said, just go to the museums, right? Museums are our, our, our libraries of life. So, we go there and say, hey, let me, how many, how many snails species did you guys measure? And so on and so forth. So, if we do that, we have something like about 1.75 million species described over the last couple centuries. That's a lot. That's a lot of counting of things, right? We have somewhere on the order of magnitude of something like 10,000-ish new species are described a year. What is it? Somebody, does anybody know how we describe a species? Somebody tell me how we, we, we quote unquote describe a new species. Essentially, we go out, and if we found this, we're like, what? This is a crazy purple butterfly. What, who's it? And we go look in the guidebook and find no purple butterfly. No purple butterfly. And then we'd, we'd, we'd go to call up the experts, the, the butterfly lepidopteran experts, maybe at a university, maybe at a museum. Go, yo, 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 I got this cool purple butterfly. Have you seen it? Do, do you know what it is? No, never heard of it. Okay, maybe we upload it to iNaturalist. So like, no, nobody comes. So try all these venues, and it seems like nobody knows what this thing is. So it's like, okay, let me go and make sure that wasn't like a paintball gun that hit. A, you know, let's go collect some more. We have, okay, here we go. Where the critter is found. And then, um, and, and we would then go through and, and write an, an academic paper that would name this organism. It would, it would describe it, it would describe what it looks like, it would describe its, its ecology, where, where it lived, its ranges, its distribution. Uh, and we would, um, and maybe if we had the resources, we would do some genetic uh, uh, typing and see how it related to other, you know, similar type of, of insects and so on and so forth. And then we would publish a paper and we would, and as the, as the publisher, we get to name it. So you get to name it. And so you'd, you'd call it whatever you wanted to, something about to honor your mom or to, to based on what it looks like or some famous you know, music star that you want to get free tickets to their concert, which people do, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, and then once it's published in an academic journal, it is therefore named. So that's the process of description. So just like we would do an academic study, but instead of doing an experimental test, we would do a very detailed description of that critter with drawings and pictures and all that kind of stuff. If you're doing like a scientific name, would you have to go along with like, like maybe related to that butterfly? Nope. Like you nope. You get, to, you get to do it. Well, I mean, usually, rarely do we describe a whole new genus. Yeah. So usually the genus would probably be it already there, but then, but then the, the species, you, you could pick it. Yep. Yep. So you could make it, like I said, name of your mom. Some, some NGOs, some museums raise money, but you all, if you guys want to get some, uh, maybe <laughs> we just passed Valentine's Day, but maybe if you want a romantic thing for your significant other, you can name a beetle after him or her, right? And so you pay like, I don't know what they pay, you know, pay like 50 bucks, 100 bucks, and they're like, okay, the next one we're naming after. And so there's actually some zoos that have done this with cockroaches, <laughs> with cockroaches for the, your ex that you really don't like, kind of thing. So, so yeah, right. I know recently, uh, hold up, you guys, hold up. There was a, a, I think a grad student that was just decided to go check out a museum's like collection mm -hmm. after Pokemon. Oh, oh yeah, po the, the old Pokemon, the old video game yeah. reference. Yes. Three legendary birds, right? Yeah. Which is very funny. Yeah. Yeah. So so you, as the namer, you you can name it what you want, as long as it's not already used by another, but you know, as long as it's not already taken by someone by a previous organism. Um, so yeah, okay, so we go there and we, we just like, let's add up all the, do, all the species we have in the records, right? And so if we do that, we get about 1.75 million, about 10,000 new uh, a year-ish. 
Um, but of that, you know, almost two million species, the vast majority of them, we have no idea what they are. They are literally a, a preserved specimen, either an alcohol or a shell or, you know, whatever. But we don't know anything about its ecology. We don't know what it ate. We don't know what ate it. We don't know how many babies it laid on a, every year, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, so the vast majority of this fantastic trove of diversity we've been blessed with, we don't understand. So there's tremendous work to be done out there, right? And I hope all you guys are involved with some way with this. Even if you don't become conservation biologists, there's all kinds of opportunities to use citizen science, all kinds of fantastic ways you can be engaged, even if it's not your primary um, uh, focus of your careers. Okay. Uh, we also have, an, there's also an additional 300,000 dead things that are definitely dead. Think of like Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptors and stuff like that. Uh, that are that are described. Um, uh, yes, so it's at least at least two to three times uh, that number of of 1.75 million are undescribed just with tropical insects. So there's a ton of insects on this planet, insect species. There's a ton of insects and insect species too. Um, okay, so that's one way. The other way uh, is we could just make some, some estimate. And so we can do that a couple different ways. We can do that with a species effort curve. So we talked about species area curves, or you know, we talked about as, as we sample a little bit more, we get more individuals, sample a little more, get more individuals. So we could do that. We could say, hey, we're, gonna, we're going to survey one square acre of this field and see how many things we get. And then we'll do another square acre. Square acre, what the hell am I saying? One acre, and then a second acre, and then a third acre, or one square meter, and a second square meter, and a third square meter, right? And we can see um, how many um, uh, additional species we get. And then say, oh my god, this, this, this field is you know, 10 square kilometers, and kind of you know, run the numbers that way. Or we could do some very intensive sampling and look, look at um, the different um, uh, constituents, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of those. Um, so here, here's just one quick example before I go on. It's just to say that the vast majority of stuff is on, on Earth is undescribed, except for vertebrates. We think we, there's a, we always discover a new vertebrate here or there, but we've pretty much got all the vertebrates. We pretty much know what's on the table for those guys. We have a pretty good idea for plants. There's still clearly undescribed species out there, but for the most part, we have a pretty good idea of plants. And we've spent a lot of time characterizing um, insects. There's still a lot unknown. But with the exception of those groups, we think that the vast majority of the true species diversity is, is, unknown, is undescribed. Right, okay, cool. Okay, um, and I'll just say that this has changed over time. So I hate pie charts, but this is the pie chart of the study, so I, you guys don't know, never make pie charts. The pie charts suck, 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 but this was in this study. Um, this is from this 2017 paper. Uh, so um, this is uh, estimates of global biodiversity. This is early 90s, right? And so just look at the, the biggest wedge here for simplicity. So this is a study from the early 90s, basically done in the 80s. And so the, like, you know, the vast majority, three quarters of the diversity is in the animal kingdom, right? And uh, this Mora paper, same thing, vast majority are, are animals. Um, now people are applying more rigorous molecular techniques and using the evolutionary species concept, not the biological species concept of these previous two, but the evolutionary species concept. And with that, animals are a small chunk of uh, the total estimated diversity. And it's, uh, it's uh, microbial life is the thing that, that's really driving most of those, those uh, the numbers. Okay, so let me, let's talk about how we could estimate the diversity of these things, right? So this is a tropical tree um, down in a place like Costa Rica. 
and it's got all kinds of insects in it, all, all kinds of bugs living on and around the tree, right? So uh, these, and in this particular study, we're going to look at weevils, which are, which are um, a type of beetle. And we, we're going to do this, this estimate of this one tree, or a few trees, and then see if we can extrapolate that out farther to get an estimate of how many species there might be, right? You guys with me? So here we go. So <clears throat> this was done in the early 80s by this famous guy, Terry Irwin, this famous uh, uh, biologist who's unfortunately since passed away. Um, but anyway, so he's trying to figure out how many arthropods are there on Earth, or at least in these tropical jungles, um, by looking at one type of arthropod. So he's going to look at these weevils. And he's going to go get 19 of these trees, and he's going to fog them. You see him fogging right here. This is with an insecticide, right? Going to kill everything. Yep. Deal with it. I, I, as a kid, I never killed ants. I never killed spiders. I never killed bees. And then I became a biologist, and I killed everything. Um, but anyway, that, that's just how it works. Um, so, okay. So, so they went up to you know, an individual tree. And they put all these sheets underneath the tree, you guys with me? And these big sort of cones, kind of like the horrible cone of shame for your dog, but like pointing to the ground. And they go to a little, a little jar that has preservative in there. So the insects, when you, when you kill them, they're like, oh! And they kind of, oh, they fall off the leaf. And they fall down. And so we blanket the ground with these, with these insect catchers, and then we fog the tree. And then we get all these things, and you get up, and here you see, uh, Terry fogging with this like fumigation device. And then you get a bunch of army like you guys, a bunch of undergrads that say, okay, everybody sit here, count up these guys. And so it's like thousands and thousands of hours of just going through all these samples. Okay. And so this is what we found. So they found on these trees, they found, this is crazy. I said only 19 trees, right? about 1,200 species of just weevils, not insects, just this one category of, of arthropods. Okay. Um, and they estimated of those 1,200 species, 163 only were ever found on this one tree species. So some are generalists. Some we see all the time when we go through the forest. But these 163 were only, seemed to only be found on this uh, this particular structure. And so we know from other studies, from existing stuff, like look at those museum records and stuff, that, uh, that beetles are about 40% of arthropod uh, categories of species, right? And so you run through that, and what you find is, even though we're just focusing on the weevils, if we extrapolated, we would guesstimate something like about, uh, about 400 species of arthropods generally were found on this tree and only this tree species. You guys following my logic on this? Everybody okay? Okay. And then we'd say, uh, it turns out we know that uh, there's more diverse things up off the ground than just walking along on the soil litter. And so when we add the soil litter and the tree species, we get something like perhaps 400 uh, species. Oh, wait, sorry, 600 species of um, arthropods on this tree, on the, in the litter, on the tree itself. And so we estimate there's about 50,000 species of tropical trees. So if we time 50,000 times 600, you get something like 300, or 30 million tropical arthropod species, right? Just tropics, just arthropods, right? So is this right or wrong? Well. It's an estimate, right? It's an estimate. So I think a lot of people will probably say this is an overestimate, but this is the approach we could take, right? So now this, this took a lot of time, but this took you know, a little bit of time. This wasn't like 30,000 years and $30 billion, right? So this, this is how we can go about getting some sideboards on our estimates of species out there. Does that make sense? OK, so these, these guys guesstimated 30 million. Um, uh, we can also do some, like in the Morrow paper, we can also do some extrapolation, right? So we can look at, again, these sort of species accumulation curves, essentially. And we can do the same thing with different taxonomic rankings. 
um, and we can we can extrapolate what we do know, and then sort of say, oh, you know, this particular group we're we're only about here, so we can estimate where we're, they're going to asymptote, etc. And that's going to give us on the order of about about nine million species. Um, similarly, um, a Hamilton does a similar type approach, gets about five and a half million species, right? So these, these are varying, 30 million, five, nine, but they're all way more than the 1.75 des uh, million described so far. That, that's the key, key aspect. Okay, there are also efforts underway to do what um, Caleb was saying at the very start, right? Which is, what if we just go count everything, right? Or go look at what's up, or look at the database. So these are efforts to try to create databases that you can start to query yourself that are trying to pull together all this stuff. So there's one in the, uh, the Neotropics, and so the Neotropics are the Americas, right? So, so in, the, in the terrestrial Central and South America regions um, run by the Smithsonian Institution. And uh, the, they're trying to just pull in all these insects they can and create a master database. Similar thing is going on with the Missouri Botanical Garden for, uh, for uh, flowering plants in uh, North America. And the same thing is going on with the Census of Marine Life, which is for all of the Earth, or all of the global ocean. There was a first attempt in 2000, and there was a renewed attempt about a decade ago to, to refresh that. But all of these are trying to pull together in one place all these lists of stuff. So instead of you having to go to Museum A, Museum B, Museum C, trying to pull all the museum stuff together and any new research that people are doing, any new net toes through the ocean, that stuff would be entered hopefully automatically into this uh, uh, master database of um, the critters. Okay, there's also some efforts to do things like biocubes. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, We'll, we'll skip that. I'll just, I'll just say that uh, there's tremendous diversity out there. It's awesome. There's all kinds of cool stuff we can do. Um, this is an example of a fish that was named after my friend. Uh, and so, so even big fish are still found. So my, my friend studied gobies for his PhD. And so, so um, this, this uh, uh, goby was named in honor of my friend. Okay. Um, uh, Time-wise. Time-wise, I'm just gonna, what's that? Not Taylor, Not Taylor Swift, no, no. Okay, so I'm gonna end real quick here. So I, I, I skipped the, how many species are around right now. We don't know, right? What you should know in terms of your re, re, you know, quizzing and understanding stuff, one, about 1 1.75 million described, right? And our estimates are anywhere from five to 30 million. I think a good estimate is around 10 million as just sort of a ballparker type of thing, right? And this is for all these estimates I'm talking about are basically for macroscopic <coughs> critters, right? So we're not, we're not focusing on the evolutionary concept, species concept where we could get down rabbit holes and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so one of the key issues for conservation, we've just spent all this time talking about diversity, is who's around to measure this diversity? Right. So when I first went up to Stanford, I was a marine biologist, and I started doing work in grasslands and oak woodlands, and I wanted to know how many insects there were. And so I, I like said, I want to go out and capture a bunch of insects. And as soon as I started doing it, I started getting all these insects. I'm like, what the hell is that? I don't know what that is. That that looks cool. I don't know what that is. That's whatever. So I I called up someone who I won't name at a famous uh, museum that I won't name, and that, 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 that whole jam was, was, was insects. And I said, yo, doing the study, so wonder if you can help me figure out how many insect species are in my field, my grass, my California grassland. And the guy said, you're an idiot. What are you, stupid? And I was, I was taken aback. I was like, wait, what? Wait, wait, what? And he said, this is, this is a direct quote from me. He said, your inquiry, meaning can you please help me identify all the insects in this field, right? Not talk about the middle of the rainforest, not talk about in the war zone in Ukraine or the bottom of the ocean or something, just in my easy to park the car next to and walk into grassland. Um, and he says, your inquiry is naive at best. If you really want to do this, meaning enumerate the insect diversity in the, this field, you need 20 years and expansive funding. 
Once you get that, call me. Right? And so at first I was super embarrassed. I thought, oh my God, I'm such an idiot, whatever. And then I started thinking about it. I'm like, what a tool. Right? What an a-hole. Yes, was I, was I naive? Of course I was naive, right? But what this guy is articulating is the old school belief, which we do not ascribe to anymore, at least we should not ascribe to anymore, which is, how do we do research? I need 20 years to do this, right? As an academic, I always want more time, right? You guys write in your species profile, you always want more time, right? I totally get it, right? If I had more time, I could do better. I could do it to keep. In this case, there's so many things, it's really, really hard. And I need, I gotta take how many hours a day looking through microscopes, comparing this individual to that individual, this individual to that. And that's what the guy was responding to. If the answer to figuring out how, what the diversity of life in my field is, is I need 20 years, the planet is dead. We, just, we don't have the time. We don't have the resources, we don't have the experts, it just ain't gonna happen. So we need to use things like morphospecies, right? And these other tools to get a sense of that diversity. Because this diversity is disappearing faster than we can count it. So if the old answer is sit in a museum somewhere and count stuff as you sip your chai all day long, that, we need people doing that, but that isn't enough. We need something more. And another problem is there are fewer and fewer taxonomists, particularly in the English-speaking world. We do have a good number of taxonomists, but they're mostly coming out of uh, places in the world that don't have robust um, universities and museum collections and stuff of that nature, uh, and are also in areas that are experiencing tremendous environmental change, <coughs> transformation in places like Brazil and India and places like that. And so essentially what, we're, what we've seen is, this is, this is, a, this is a, a paper from a couple, a couple decades ago now, but, but basically it's talking about, the, this is a people publishing studies, and these are uh, lay, lay folks that aren't you know, officially a museum person or a university professor or whatever, and then these are quote unquote professionals. And what we see is there is a peak of folks in the 50s after World War II when a lot of people were, there was such evil in the world, and they want to retreat, that people just took comfort from going out and counting birds and getting familiar with the plants and stuff. We've decayed from that period, right? We've decayed. So, so there are fewer folks that are actually able to identify stuff. So what I just mentioned was, hey, we're doing the study in a grassland. So diverse are the insects that there's no, there really isn't such a thing as a person that knows everything about the insects. There is a person that's the spider, well, that's not an insect, it's a but arthropod, but, but you know, there's a, there's a mite expert, there's a dragonfly expert, there's a butterfly expert, there's a, there's a beetle, not beetle, it's like a, a you know, a buprested beetle of North American terrestrial environments uh, expert, right? And so what I would do is if I, if, I, if I did this study and I had, I clicked all these insects, and I would do some initial sorting and say, okay, here are my dragonflies, here are my bees, here are my whatever. Then what I would do, as I'd look in a guidebook, but the things I, couldn't, I wasn't sure of or I couldn't tell, I would then physically mail those samples to a, a university or a museum. And I'd go, yo, 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 can you help me out? I'm trying to figure out what this is. And they go, sure, thanks. They are not paid to do this for the most part. They're just, so it comes in. And so it sits on the shelf, just like on the back of our shelf right there. And so maybe you might be lucky if you can really entice them into saying, there's a dam that's about to be built. I really need to know. Can you really help me tell me if this is an endangered species or something? Maybe he or she can do that. But generally speaking, it's going to go to the back of the line and they're going to have, who the heck knows, a hundred samples from other folks that have sent them stuff. And then my spiders, I'm gonna send my spiders to Kansas because that's where this Kansas, that, that's where the spider expert is. And then I'm gonna send my worms to, and on like that, and th like that type of thing, right? So it's, it's a real challenge to get these things identified. Fantastic diversity, but it's a real challenge for those of us doing conservation. Um, and I'll just say that uh, our technical skills are evolving. We're almost out of time here. Um, uh, uh, we're getting better. This is Ernst Teckel, you guys might, you guys, Remember hearing, have you guys heard the term ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny? No, no. <laughs> ontogeny is, is how things develop. 
So the larval stage, you know, embryo developing. And so, so you and I all had tails. We don't have tails now, but you and I all had tails at one point. You and I all had pharyngeal gill slits when we were in the womb, right? We don't have gills right now, or walk around this room, we don't have gills. And so the idea, this idea is this idea that, oh, this is, this is, this is not right, this is, this is not correct. But the thought was, oh, as we develop in mom's womb, we go, quote unquote, go through the evolutionary process, which isn't, isn't true. But, but Heckel was one of the first proponents of that. He was a fantastic guy of organizing um, uh, life. Of course, he did it with humans, particularly men at the top of the tree, right? Which is not how we consider that, 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 that that's, that's not right. But separate from that, separate from all the scientific contributions, check this out. These are all hand drawings that he did of diatoms, of anemones, right? So we've had some, back in the day, describing species, people had fantastic skill sets. They didn't have digital cameras. They didn't have a stuff. They had to be able to articulate, observe, and document. And so, um, yeah, okay, this is gonna, we're gonna run out of time, Sarah. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll just do some, I'll record some of this for you guys. Um, suffice it to say, uh, our technical skills are evolving and we need technical skills. You have wonderful things such as iNaturalist and things in your pocket now that have auto or, um, or automatic identification of things, a leaf, an insect. It's not perfect by any means, but it's a nice start, particularly when you're super new to identifying organisms and are totally not sure. So it may not give you the answer, but at least give you the kind of, it's, this is a type of a, a vena. <laughs>